you know, it's tough, man. It's something I see a lot of people struggle with. Like I from San Francisco Bay Area, right? And I wasn't like I was doing okay, and I had you know a small business and I had a job, but I felt like I was always just kind of scraping, you know, scraping to get by. And I, you know, we try travel. And did- Hey everyone, Joe Moffat here with Master Life by Design, and I am excited for today's episode with the Millionaire Series. I have Chase Calhoun here, and he is from Little Rock, Arkansas. He's got a business, he's got a family, he's a rock star, he's part of our Go Abundance Mastermind Tribe, and he's crushing it in what he's doing, and he's actually doing this interview as him and his family are traveling in California right now, which is super awesome. Chase, thanks for doing this interview, and welcome. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yes. So we were just chatting before we went live here and Chase and his family are in California on vacation. And I want you to talk about how you guys are able to have your business do what it's doing as you guys are on the road and experiencing life and living life by design. But before we jump into that, I'd love for you to just share with people a little bit about your history, your background. How did you get to this point um, in in your life where you're worth over seven figures, you've you got a business rocking, you have family, you're traveling. So just to share with us, take a couple of minutes to just share your background so people get to know you a little. Yeah, absolutely. So uh my wife, Brenda, and I and our we have two children now. So I've got uh Nico who's eleven and then a uh, a baby girl. So she's six months old. Uh we're in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um we had actually relocated from California. So I'm from California originally, San Francisco Bay Area. And about six years ago, we decided to move uh, to Little Rock. And so so that I could start investing full time in real estate. Um, at the time when we moved, we, you know, I still had a, a full time kind of W2 type job um, and relocated there with that. Uh, and then really just started investing as much as I could. So buying as many basically buy and hold rental properties as possible. Um, somewhere along the way, I kind of, sometimes I question whether it's good or bad, bad, but we got into like heavy rehab, um, rental properties. So like, kind of like fix and flips in a way, but almost like the stuff that were too bad for the flippers to even buy. And so, uh, we just kind of, we started doing those and, um, they're really, they're hard and they're stressful, but there's a, there's a really good opportunity to force a lot of value, um, by buying these kind of like crappy properties and, and fix them up, making them brand new. Um, we also, you know, I also along the way got into, you know, selling real estate and uh, a little bit of property management. So we, we helped some kind of clients, mainly out of state guys, uh, get into buying, you know, buying, fixing up and home rental properties. Um, now today, like things have shifted a little bit, we've gotten away from that. We're getting into more development. So I'm a licensed general contractor, uh, real estate developer. We're going we're gonna to start doing some more, uh, build to sell. Um, and, and, and maybe even some fix and flips, if it makes sense, just due to the, the kind of the interest rate environment right now. Awesome. That's amazing. Before we jump into some of the numbers, how did you and your wife meet? We actually, we met in California, not too long before we, we moved. She's going to hate me for saying this on a podcast, but I was joking around saying I got seduced by my CrossFit coach. So she was my, she's the CrossFit instructor at the local gym. And so that's where we met. Um, and, and it was, you know, uh, a little bit prior to us deciding to move and it wasn't long. It wasn't long, honestly, after we, we started dating where I was like, Hey, I want to do this thing. Uh, but I'm not going to go unless you come with me. And she said, Hey, let's do it. So we literally packed up, um, sold everything, packed up, moved across the country and, and started investing in real estate. So it was looking back, it was kind of a wild story because we started from very little. It's gone very well, but, um, it was, it was an interesting ride to get to where we're at today. That's for sure. I love it. I love it, man. Okay. Well, don't let her listen to this episode. <laughs> you so up it's your okay. instructor. I love it. Um, all right. So before we jump in, uh, let's do this because I want people to know, you know, credibility. We all talk numbers here. Listen, everyone that's listening and go button into our mastermind. Um, we have what's called a one sheet where we talk about our net worth, our active income, our passive income. And the reason why that mastermind was so attractive to me was because out here in the Boise, Idaho area, I didn't find many movers and shakers. I love talking numbers. If someone's worth more than me, 
it's an insp inspiration for me. If someone's not worth as much as me, right? Not that that's a measuring stick of how of life if you're successful, not because I don't measure in finances, but it was like, how can I help them, right? So either way, it was a win yeah. for me, at least. And so I want to help just with the audience. If you're like me and you get inspired by numbers, we're going to jump into them really quickly. So Chase, um, for the audience, what is your total net worth? You said you had hardly anything when you were in California and then you moved. Where are you today, six years later, from zero to what? 3.5 million. So we just crossed 3.5 3. 3. 5, 3. 5 this year, yeah. Woo! Congratulations, man. That's amazing. Because most people, they grossly overestimate what they could do in a year and totally underestimate what they could do in 10 years. And just crossing the six year mark, it sounds like you guys went from almost zero to three and a half million. For everyone that's listening right now, if you're not worth, you know, even a hundred thousand dollars, that's okay because things can change. And so we're going to pull out of chase some of the things that he's done to be able to get to this point. And um, we already, you already shared one and we'll dive into that here in a moment. But what I do want to ask is for you. Um, what is your total cash flow on a monthly basis passively? So gross rents is sitting at about $60,000 a month right now. Um, and so by the time you factor in, you know, debt service, debt service and all the expenses, and I usually estimate probably more conservatively, um, probably about $20,000 a month, just in straight net cash flow from the rental properties. Um, it, it, it may be a little bit more, um, but that would be a conservative estimate. Excellent. I mean, for those that are listening for the first time, when you say gross, what does that mean? That means total rent. So $60,000 a month is the total rent that we collect at the beginning of the month. But once I pay you know, loan payments, so debt service, um, and then any kind of expenses, so maintenance repairs, that kind of thing, um, that's where we end up is that start with the gross, we end up with that net cash flow, true cash flow. Mm -hmm. So in six years, you went from zero passive income to $20,000 a month net, which allows you guys, and I know how expensive it is to live in Little Rock, Arkansas. You know, I know it's a, <laughs> it's big. It's kind of like San Francisco, yeah. like the Bay Area. Now. Yeah, yeah. But you could get by, you guys can get by, pay your bills, but it allows you and affords you guys the opportunity to travel like you are today and what you guys are doing with your family, which is so awesome. How many people out there could use an extra 20 grand passively, not active, passive, right? Like that's huge. That's a, that's a game changer for a lot of people. That's a quarter million dollars a year coming in. And most people don't even make that actively on an active salary. So I love it. So, all right, I want to touch on something really important. And I'd love to get the mindset that you and your wife had um around you were in the bay area obviously we know that's one of the most expensive metropolitan areas right um but you guys moved with the intention not to hey we want we want to you know have this beautiful home or you know we have family or friends did, by the way did you know anyone when you moved out there uh we've never even been to visit so we literally bought a house sight unseen that was like a horrific fixer-upper foreclosure and packed up and moved and camped out while we fixed it out up. Uh, so it was it was a jump and a change and culture shock and everything else. But, but you guys did it with the intent yeah. to invest. It was for your financial future to get to this 20,000 a month passively and growing. Like you guys did it. What was the mindset behind that for you guys? Because that's huge. A lot of people wouldn't give up their comfortable life and their friends and their family and their location and just pick up and move. So what was it for you? It, you know, it's tough, man. It's something I see a lot of people struggle with. Like I from San Francisco Bay Area, right? And I wasn't like I was doing okay and I had, you know, a small business and I had a job, but I felt like I was always just kind of scraping, you know, scraping to get by. And I, you know, we try traveled and did fun stuff like that a little bit, but you know, like I didn't live in that nice of an area, or that nice of a house. And it was always just a I felt like I was working really hard just to get by and for me I, whether i knew it whether i actually knew it or i just had like that feeling i i think i knew that i had to move somewhere if i want and i wanted to invest in real estate for years it just i kind of didn't do it in 08 or 09 when i should have and it didn't make sense in california anymore um so it's just that 
idea that if I left and I went somewhere where it did make sense to do it, and this was kind of pre the whole out of state real estate investor thing wasn't as mainstream, um, but just making that jump to move there and, and, and actually start doing it, it was a uh, it was really hard at the time because we left all of our family and friends, the places you know that we grew up or whatever. Uh, but looking back, man, that was just it was a life changing decision for us. We wouldn't be I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today if it wasn't for that decision to to move to start doing it in person it changed our lives and it was hard and it, it was hard for a few years uh, but definitely paid off yeah so many people think like oh they just moved and you know they did what they had to do but they don't understand that there's a sacrifice there's a price to pay yeah. for something like this for your dream right and to be able to make it possible and how to what, how did you sell it to your wife? Well, should I say your uh, CrossFit instructor at the time? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think I just, I just, hey, this is something that, you know, I've wanted to do for a really long time. And I think it would be good just, you know, not just financially, but for us to go somewhere like this and, and try to get ahead. Um, and she, she was just, hey, let's do it. Wow. I love that. She um, now, it. once we got there, there's definitely some times where she was like, I don't know if we made the right decision, but um, no, it just, it's a hard adjustment, but once we once we got there, and it, like I said, it, it took a couple of years, but it it all paid off. And so I think now, even if she would tell you that it, it was the best decision that we ever made making that move. So, so you had a small business. She was a CrossFit instructor. You um you had a W two. So explain to us like what you did to did you quit it all and just leave it all behind and pack up and go, or where what was uh, the situation there? No, so I worked in commercial insurance and it was kind of a niche thing that I did in commercial insurance. And I was able to, uh, able to call a company that I'd worked for in the past. And I literally, I said, cause I didn't pick Little Rock, Arkansas, because that's where I knew I should go to invest. I called this company and I said, Hey, where can you send me other than California and pay me the same thing you paid me here? <laughs> where do you have work for me? And, uh, and they like, well, you sure you don't want to stay in California? You want to go to San Diego? Like we'll pay you, we'll pay you more to go to San, you know, Texas, places like that. And, and just one of the places she said, Hey, we have a need in, in Little Rock, Arkansas. So never thought about that, but let me look it up and just looked it up and really just looked at like the cost of, you know, the purchase price of homes and the cost of what I could buy a house there for and like what it would rent for in the same neighborhood. And I was like, oh, you know, holy cow, that looks amazing. Um, you know, kind of not knowing that it was the hood and, and, you know, we did one there and then like kind of got out of that neighborhood. But, um, you know, that's I people ask me all the time, hey, how'd you end up in Little Rock, Arkansas? And I always tell people we got lost and this is where we ended up. Um, it really was just that's it was kind of coincidental that we ended up started investing there. And so it's worked out amazing. It's an amazing place to invest. I just, I wish it was a more educated decision. It really was. It was where can you send me uh, where you pay me the same? And that's where we, we decided to go. But there's some brilliance in that thought process, right? It's like, hey, I want to be able to make the same amount of money and somewhere that you can go where you can actually take what your desire, your dream to invest in and be like, hey, this makes sense for us. We could actually multiply our wealth very quickly. So while, you know, it might not be as calculated as you may think you want it, it was actually a brilliant move, right? Um, so obviously that profession can be lucrative, right? Do you still do that today? Did you dismiss it? And if so, when? I don't anymore. So I officially quit um, about, well, I think it was like early last year. Um, so it's been over a year since I, I quit. And that was a big... Um, it was it was weird, man, because I was I was doing really well, um, and my job because of COVID had gotten extremely easy. It was a very in person like meeting with people type thing, and then because of COVID, that all went away. And so my I was kind of ready to quit a couple of years ago, and and then COVID happened, and it got to the point where I could really get my work done in a very small amount of time, um, and and so it was kind of hard to leave that like that comfortable salary um, and quit. But it was uh, honestly, it was some other go abundance guys that kind of pushed me or challenged me to walk away from that. And it's been, you know, obviously it's been really good. I'm glad I did it. And I'm glad I left when I, when I did, but it was a tough, tough jump to leave that. I kind of yeah. held on to it for as long as I could. And it was just taking basically all that extra money and funneling it into the business and investing and stuff like that. So it definitely helped. That's awesome. And it, it does. It really does. I have clients all the time that are in this position and eventually they do need to let go because yes, the money's good, but 
when you have, when you experience that full on freedom and you have the cash flow covering you, they have that security and everything else is about acceleration at that point. But you touched on something big and I want to hit on it. It was like your master, your mastermind group, your, your go pod, right. They held your feet to the fire. Just talk about the power of having accountability and people pushing you because a lot of people, they're afraid of it. Because it pushes them outside their comfort zone and they don't want to commit to that. Why did you allow them to hold your feet to the fire and and just be a part of this journey with you? How how important and what impact did that make for you? It's huge. I mean, I think that like my business and and what I've going on has kind of taken off since I, I quit that job. And I think it's one of those things where it's like, and not just this, but there's a bunch of stuff that we have going on in our lives or our businesses or whatever. And we may know that we should do that thing. Um, and it may be very obvious to other, even to ourselves, but it's like, we don't want to, right? And so it's when you get in that, that kind of that group setting and, and you're talking through what you're doing and stuff like that. And they're like, eh, come on, man. Like you, you don't need to do this. And it's not whatever that extra hundred thousand dollars a year is really not helping you. It's probably hurting you. And, and so it's just, I think that when you're connecting and you're being like, very open and honest about here's my financial situation here's all the stuff i'm going on there they can look at it from an outsider looking in and be like you need to stop doing that it's not help you think it's helping you but it's not so um and then kind of like what would it take or what would it look like you for you to feel comfortable quitting and it's just it's funny because it's like you know you should do it anyways and it's just them seeing it and kind of pushing you for it um and i think that whole like that's why i'm a part of go abundance that's really powerful and again it's not just with that it can do with everything but um i highly doubt that i would quit my job or be where i'm at today if it's not it wasn't for a group like go abundance and it doesn't have to i like go abundance i know you're a part of it uh, but it could be anything like that or even a group of friends who are trying to do something similar or go somewhere similar but it's just it's we talked about it a little bit before it's sometimes it's hard to find those people um local to you so being a part of a group like that makes it a little bit easier Absolutely. And everyone's so open and transparent and the intention in the heart is to help you move on to where you go. So question you may have an answer for as a result of them holding you accountable and challenging you and pushing you. When you left, what did that do for your business and your financial situation? Oh, it just I think it helped, you know. I, I would have to look back and see exactly, but I, I imagine that my financial situation's more than doubled since then. So my net worth, it probably tripled, you know, if not doubled, maybe tripled. Um, and then also rent, like the gross rents or the net, you know, cash flow. So is more than doubled since then. Um, just allowing me to focus more on that thing that, you know, the dollar productive things instead of being, um, tied to a job. And then honestly, like a lot of it, which I don't think people realize and was kind of the hard part for me to deal with, but it's also like a kind of like an identity thing. Um, getting rid of that old kind of, you know, W2 identity and and moving towards an entrepreneur, you know, full time, 100% all in, you know, entrepreneur, real estate developer, investor. Um, I think that's probably what made the biggest shift. And so it wasn't even the money thing. It was more that the identity of getting away from that. Yeah. That's so powerful. You know, as I coach a lot of clients around identity, that is one of the most critical components because sometimes people identify as their job, as their position, right? And it becomes such a challenge for people who's been, the longer you're in a job and in a certain career, you're locked into that identity. And one of the things as coaching people through to like step into financial freedom is they start, I have them shift their identity. And what I mean by that is start leading that you're a in real estate investor. And then, oh, you also do commercial insurance, right? And you, you flip it and it, it makes a shift for the individual and it, it really becomes powerful. So, but here you are full-time entrepreneur crushing it and continuing to grow. I love it, man. Um, so I, I'm real quick. I just want to touch on, you said you have a, a property management company. Was that something you started during your job or after your job? It was kind of during. And so in the, with property management, we're, I don't own a full blown large scale property management company, nor do I have any interest in, in that. Like that's probably, that'll be the next thing to go for clients. Uh, but 
because I wanted to be vertically integrated, right? So uh, we do in-house property management, all the constructions in-house. Um, one thing I did just to make more vertical income, and I still do a little bit of it today, but not as much, is kind of helping other real estate investors do the same thing that I was doing. So we'd help them find a house, buy the house. Um, we would do the construction, fix it up, and then we'd manage it for them. Um, so we still do that for a handful of, of clients. But again, I'm not... Uh, property management is a, a, a tough, tough industry, and I have little intention to running a full-blown property management company anytime soon. I've got some really, I've got two guys in one of my GoPods that both have very successful, large property management companies, and it's it's very lucrative, but it's a that's a tough a tough business to run. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you hit on something key, and I actually made a video on this in the past, but you talked about vertical integration. A lot of people listen, they may not understand what you mean by that. Can you break that down a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of, and a good example, a lot of real estate investors, like an out-of-state real estate investor, whoever, um, they really need help, you know, and so they'll have other people kind of handle everything for them. Um, so they may not even find the properties, but they just want to buy it as an investment. And that's, that's much easier. It's just you have less control and sometimes it's not, it doesn't work as well, especially in places like Little Rock. And so when I say vertically integrated, what I mean is like my company uh, finds the properties that we're going to purchase. Um, we do all, we manage all the construction in house. So whether it's building a new construction house or doing a big renovation or even light construction, we do all that in house. Um, and then we also do all of our own property management. So I've got a full-time property manager that works for me. Um, so that's what I mean by vertically integrated. We handle kind of all steps of that process from the from the acquisition all the way through the, the property. Yeah. And then you can do that for other companies to make money and you get to do it at cost. And so, um, yeah, I was thinking for me, I'm like, I have my coaches that work for me and I got to pay them. I'm like, well, one of the projects that we can eventually develop is, you know, a payroll system where we can go out and help other small businesses with that. And that will be part of our vertical integration. We won't have to pay fees. We can actually make money from the software and then uh, capitalize on it. So um, you're doing it anyways, when you're doing it anyways, when you need it anyways, it makes, it makes a ton of sense. So. Absolutely. And so vertical integration is a huge component to solve many other people's issues, but also get your stuff at for free or at cost or whatever it might be. So uh, you can check out the video I did in Master Life by Design, scroll through the videos. Maybe we'll put it up at the top here and go from there. So, all right. So project management, if you guys want to learn more about that, maybe we'll have someone on the show that's all about PM, maybe someone in your GoPod. So people that are interested in that, it can be a great way to <clears throat> start creating an active income to get you out of your nine to five, if you want to be in the real estate space, and then as it grows, start to leverage and outsource where it can start to be passive. It's a lot of heavy lifting in the beginning. There's a lot of work and it might not be like chases where they do the full construction. It might just be like, hey, you're managing a duplex and you're, you know, if you get the call at two o'clock in the morning, you got to make the plumber, you know, show up right then and there, right? Real quick. So, um, but we'll we'll talk about that on future uh, future episodes. So I want to shift into something that you said that is very rare. I haven't had anyone on the show that's talked about this, but you are now into heavy rehab. You're not just into like fix and flip rehabs. You do that, but heavy rehab. Tell us, be more specific on what heavy rehab, what that what that really looks like, and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah. So when I say heavy rehab, I mean like you know we buy stuff that has like caught on fire and almost burnt the ground. Uh, we did one last year where the whole, like the whole house had caught on fire and the whole roof kind of collapsed in on itself. And like, we'll literally go in there and salvage that house and rebuild it um, kind of from the ground up. Uh, we do a lot of like, right now we're working on some like, like all my antique duplexes. These things were like, you know, a hundred years old and had been remodeled, just like kind of like covering stuff up a bunch of times. And so we'll go in there and do like a full gut all the way down to the studs and even like with those ones like the whole floor structures and the whole things the interiors of them have to be reframed so it's not just like when i think of people doing like a you know a rehab or a remodel on a rental property or flip it's more like go in there and paint some new flooring and and that's that's like a what i would consider a lighter rehab we're doing stuff where it's like you know it could be you know 80 to 
over a, well over a hundred thousand um, dollars for a rehab. Um, and so they're just larger construction projects. They take longer, they're a little bit more intensive, but for whatever reason, that's kind of what we've gotten into. How did you get into that? Because thinking about like a house burning down or halfway burned down, a roof collapsing versus, you know, your traditional fix it flip where you're like, yeah. okay, you know, yeah. what, what got, what led you there? It's just one of those things where it's like, and I always tell people this, like you don't necessarily, and I don't know that I hope that in five years we have this conversation, I'm not still doing the same thing because it is hard and stressful. Uh, but it's just like, we bought the first rental property and it was a big project. And then it's like, I had an opportunity to present itself to buy a house. I literally bought a house at auction um, in Little Rock for $6,000. Um, but it, the house had been, yeah, it's crazy. It's like a Toyota Camry, a used Toyota Camry or something. This is so cheap. Um, but it had been sitting vacant for 10 years out in the country. And like, so the roof, there's holes in the roof. And like, it was just, it was, it was a nightmare. It was, it was in really, really bad shape, you know? And like, everybody thought I was crazy because I bought it. And I'm like, well, $6,000. Like, I don't think I can mess this up. Um, and so we went through the whole process to remodel that. And it was a lot of work. It was a lot of headache, but we were able to force, I, I call force and appreciation. And we were able to force a lot of value because we buy it really cheap. We make it basically like brand new. And then now all of a sudden I've got, you know, with that one specifically, maybe seventy or $80,000 into the project, but now it's worth 150000 And so it's not just a small light rehab with a little bit of value, You're forcing a lot of value. There. Got it. That is a first off. That's amazingly cheap, right? Like, yeah, it's crazy. We I bought some I bought some crazy deals in, in Little Rock. Ten thousand dollars. I paid ten thousand dollars for a a couple of years later. Ten thousand dollars for a, a fourplex that had caught on fire. Wow. Um, so I bought an entire four unit townhome building for ten thousand dollars. We've had we've had a handful like that. Where I bought them really cheap, uh, but they're they're like they're totaled. Nobody wants them. They just want to get rid of it. Um, and so that's that's kind of how we got it. It was just like. That one led to a, a worse one, which led to a worse one, which led to the fourplex and then a house burnout. And so it was just um, just kind of one after another like that. That's awesome. And my guess, I don't know, but my guess, my hallucination would be that you're able to make a lot more margin because it's in a lot worse condition. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, you can, you can create a lot more value. So I'm just, I, you're buying them so cheap and that, again nobody else wants them nobody else wants to deal with their headache so and it just kind of again it they've just presented themselves kind of one after another since we've been doing that and then um kind of you know not a good thing but unfortunately little rock was hit by a tornado um, earlier this year i actually had intended not to buy anything this year i was going to kind of just sit on the sidelines to see what happens with the economy um and then we got i was I like, I don't think Little Rock's ever been hit by a tornado. They have tornadoes in Arkansas. I told all my family that like, oh, move to Little Rock. There's never any tornadoes there. You don't have to worry about it. And then lo and behold, we had one hit. So we ended up buying a bunch of properties that had been damaged by the tornado. And so um, it's it's a good way to, like I said, force that value. Because you end up with basically a new building, um, but with a lot more margin than trying to build or, or, or do it a different way. Yeah. What's the, what's the most you ever made on a property, you know, whether it's heavy rehab or fix it flip, what is the most that you've ever done? We don't sell, I don't sell a lot of properties. We've sold very few. Um, and, and that may change a little bit. We talked about with the interest rate environment kind of changing, we're probably going to start selling more of them. Uh, but for example, I think that fourplex, that, that, uh, that four unit townhome building that I did, which I still own today, um, and it's on the same street as a lot of these tornado projects that we're doing. I think when I was, when everything was all finished, I was into it for about $300,000, maybe a little bit less. Um, and it was worth half a million. That was $200,000 in value. Again, it's not, it's not realized right until it's sold. It's just, it's, uh, it's value on paper, but that's, that's a realistic, like appraised value is 500,000, $200,000 on that one. Um, I've done some small apartment buildings now, um, they were heavy rehab. And, and so maybe a little bit more on those, maybe 300,000. Nice. For anyone that wants to get in the game of fixing and flipping, not easy right now with, like you said, with where interest interest rates are, which by the way, where are they? You said it earlier. You're, you have your finger on the pulse. Commercial. So I just, I just closed a commercial construction loan at 8.5%, which is a lot higher than they were a year ago. <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, what were they last year? Like five and a half, six percent 
Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, the I think some of the, we luckily I started reef. I had a feeling this was going to happen um, kind of on the tail end of the whole COVID thing once they did the first little increase or two. So I refinanced a bunch of our properties just to get some runway time. But um, yeah, we, I have loans locked in, I think at 4.2. 5% or like some of the original ones. And now they're just double uh, where they were a year and a half ago or so. so. Come on. Brilliant, man. Brilliant. I love it. Well, obviously you could, you know, go out, cash out, make 200, 300 K on some of these properties. Um, and the hearing someone that's listening, that's, you know, they haven't done it before. They're looking, most of our audience is high performers. They own the small business, but they're, they make good money, but they don't have any passive income or they work a high nine to five job, but they have no passive income. Um, they might sit there and be like, wow, you could take two or 300K and run with that. That's amazing. But your thought process is a little bit different. You're, it seems like you're all about the cash flow, right? 100%. So that's been, my number one priority from the get go is is I wanted that passive income, that cash flow, um, which again allows me to be sitting here talking to you on a podcast in Napa, um, and uh, it's it's kind of wild to think about, but it's I'm still making money right now talking to you because of that passive income, the cash flow. Uh, so when I got into this, I I literally did everything I could to not sell properties, even though I can make a quick buck and earn a lot of money. We did sell some. There's some where just made sense to sell them and I needed the money to continue to invest. But even then when I would sell something, I'd roll right into more, you know, uh, rental properties so passive, passive income. So it's, it's super important. And that, that money you make that hundred thousand or $200,000 and you're going to go, you know, spend it on dumb stuff or whatever, and then it's gone. But if you can leave it there and just collect that cash flow, it, it really one or two rental properties doesn't, and start to you know it's it's not life changing but you start to get up i think for me it was like around 20 units it really starts to get noticeable and i think we're, we're just shy of 50 50 units leased up right now um and that's it really starts to like i said that twenty thousand dollars a month it's 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 hard almost to get used to because it just it's every month it comes in on the first you know, it's just, it's, that's amazing and and how young are you i'm 37 so for those of you that are listening, if you're in your 20s, if you wanted to start now and just even follow Chase's path, you, by your early 30s, if not 30, you could be financially free making 20 grand a month. Now, you know, 37, I'm 38. So we're both super young. We have plenty of time. But over this next decade, where do you want to get your cash flow? So some people give me give me shit, but I think it's a good goal. I'd like to get to a million dollars passive. So that's, I'm probably just going to keep pushing as hard as I can until I hit that, that million, you know, million dollar a year mark. Um, and then I'm sure I'll reevaluate and keep doing it anyways. Just so I think people like us are, you know, we're just wired this way and we're going to do it regardless. It's, it's, you get to a point where it's not really, it's not really about the money. It's about freedom. Um, and then it's, you know, you know, get back and do other things and kind of do what I want to do. But a uh, million dollars a year is where I'm pushing, pushing pretty hard to. Yeah. Nice. And you could probably scrape by at a million a year passively. So, I mean, you know, guys get by a little bit, but um, that's awesome. That's, that's huge. And for a lot of people, they think, oh my gosh, that's a lot of properties. Is it all going to be residential? Are you going to move into bigger commercial? What are your thought process around that to accelerate you to a million? Yeah. So right now, I mean, we do small single family houses and small multifamily. It seems to have worked really well for us. It is more, uh, a little bit more management intensive. Um, at some point, I would love to get into commercial a little bit, uh, especially, you know, some of the bigger triple net or light industrial stuff. I it interests me a lot. Um, but I'm also a big believer of like, kind of focus on what you're good at and, and good at, you know, small apartments and, and single family houses. And so for now, we're just going to, I'm going to keep chugging along there. Um, and, and again, who knows in the future, I'm sure I'll get into bigger stuff. Just it makes more sense as that, as that starts to grow, but I don't know when that'll be. Yeah, absolutely. And my hallucination is you're not going to be doing any property management when, as you're moving forward around that, like all your million dollar plus in that testing. Yeah, yeah. So um, look, the name of the game is freedom, right? And that's the whole thing. I always tell people financial freedom is not the end goal. Financial freedom is a starting point. And while you guys have an incredible life now and you're moving towards that million dollar a year passive mark, um, 
your lifestyle, the what you guys are have created for yourself, the life that you design is is amazing. Now, you said there's other things you want to do. I want people to understand it's not about money. Money's a tool. And so as your income and this tool keeps increasing, what are some of the things that you want to do to make an impact or to give back in certain ways? Like some that means a lot to you and your family. What are some of those ways? So one thing that like we've talked about with my family, we've talked about recently is trying to give back more and give back in ways that are important to all of us um and so like brenda for example she she loves animals that's like her passion so she's working on right now trying to find a way where she can either donate or be involved in some of the the local you know, animal shelters and and maybe at some point like look at trying to help open something like that so i think just again the and it's hard for a lot of people, I think, to understand, but to me, like money really is, I care less about money, right? It's just, I enjoy what I do, but the money can be used as a tool to do positive things. Um, so I think that's a big driver to get to that level where you have, I mean, I'm not, I, we could live fine. And like right now, still have amazing lives. We just stop today. But as we continue, as I continue to grow my business, and my passive income, that allows us to be able to give back that much more and do things that they were passionate about. So I think right now it's just, you know, finding some stuff that each one of us are passionate about, you know, to give more to those causes um, is something that we're working on today. That's awesome. That's awesome. I know a lot of people out there are big dog lovers. And so be able to contribute back to them. Our family's debating whether they have a dog or not because we travel so much and it's like, yeah. it's a lot of work, you know. Still, but, it's still worth it though. I just, I enjoy it. It is yeah. hard. We, we travel a ton. I mean, I think we've only been home, you know, a couple of days in the last 20 or so. And so luckily we have family close by. And so they watch the, watch the pets for us. They're fun. That's awesome. So you convince family to move out there and then a tornado happens. That's awesome. Every, uh, I brought everybody and everybody was worried about tornadoes. And I said, tornadoes never hit Little Rock. You don't have to worry about it. And it came right through town. <laughs> so not happy with me. Before we wrap up, I got some questions, but I do want to ask this one um, because, again, money is just a tool. But since you've been able to create this life, what's one of the coolest memories that you've created as a family because of financial freedom? Man, there's, there's so many. And it's just, uh, again, I'm not like, I don't like flashy clothes or I drive a paid off 2019 Ford Fusion. You know what I mean? Like I don't, I don't need stuff, but I absolutely love spending money on trips and, you know, eating out at nice restaurants. So experiences, I guess. Um, yeah. And we've just, we've, we've had some amazing experiences over the last, I would say two years because we were able to afford to do them. Um, and just stuff that wasn't like to me, never attainable before i guess um and I, one that sticks out is like we were able to go to disney world and do like the private vip plaid tour where they kind of take you behind the scenes and bounce you around to the different parks and and just it was very expensive but it, it didn't matter because we were able to afford to do it and that's an experience that i know you know we'll probably always remember even right now i mean i'm sitting talking to you and i'm at this absolutely amazing beautiful resort in Yieldsburg, california and and five or six years ago, I wouldn't, I, mean, I wouldn't even have known this place existed, and let alone be able to afford to stay here. And so it's just, again, money's, I think it's a tool, but it can be used for, you know, really cool experiences. And that's something that's worth spending it on for sure. That's awesome, man. It's so cool. And I'm sure, you know, to see your kids light up during that experience was probably awesome. Or your oldest, should I say, your youngest probably doesn't, uh, you know. Well, she wasn't there, unfortunately. But... Okay we'll be back someday with her so there you go and so i love that and it is and i say we're we're totally aligned i'm the same way we don't buy you know flashy clothes or cars or anything it's like what are the experiences because at the end of the day you know you can't tell me the most expensive thing you bought when you were 25 right you don't remember that but you do remember the trip that you took with you know your buddies or your family like you you carry those memories forever and that's what it's about so absolutely love it that's money's a tool you're spot on man um 
All right. As we, before we wrap up, I got some rapid fire questions for you. Um, one, if you in 30 seconds, if you had to start all over, you lost everything and had to start all over, what would be the path that you what would you do to reclaim where you are? 30 seconds. And I so either two things, I would either reach out to some other go abundance guys who I know and respect and I know have really lucrative businesses and I would ask if I could come work for them. Uh, because I know it wouldn't take long if you work really hard for somebody that was very successful to be able to kind of get back on your feet. Um, and or I, I'm in real estate. So I think like I've never done wholesaling, but I think wholesaling is an amazing way for somebody that's just getting started and has nothing uh, to really like create value to somebody like me who buys properties and make you know, really good money from that. <laughs> And so the theme there is, you know, first is working hard, right? But also your yeah. network, plugging in with people who have opportunities that are successful. So go build your network if you're listening. Go network with people. If you don't have anything to add value to them, you do. You have energy, you have time, and you can, if you you can plug into them, you can help them. Ask them, what can I do to serve you, right? How can I prove my myself to you, right? So anyway, uh, one book that. Again, if you started over, you, we drained all your knowledge that you had to pick that you could dive back into. Not rich dad, poor dad, or thinking you're rich. That's what it comes yeah, what yeah I, I think for everybody, it's like rich dad, poor dad would be the number one. But one that's I think impacted what I'm doing a lot today is who, not how. Um, mm. I think that's a it's an easy read. It's a great it's a great book, and it really like it's it'll it'll help people be able to expand a little bit because you're really bringing in the who and not trying to do everything yourselves. That's, that's been a big shift that I'm trying to make right now. And it's helping a lot. That is the number one challenge I find with a lot of my clients and entrepreneurs is the leveraging component, right? They're such a, they're so good at what they do. They're a great artist, but they hand it over to someone else. Um, there's all these known limiting beliefs. And then there's also these unknown limiting beliefs that we discover that prevent them from actually leveraging. And what I actually, when I say prevent them from leveraging, what I truly mean underneath of it, what I'm really saying is you're preventing yourself from making more money and financial freedom. Yeah. That's what we're talking about. Most entrepreneurs don't understand that. So I want to say come work for me and then we accelerate that time frame in half the time or less. So anyway, yeah. um, shameless plug around the power of coaching. So um, last question, and that is, I want to see how I want to frame this. If you were speaking to an 18 year old who just graduated high school, what's one piece of wisdom that you would give them that they could carry with them the rest of their life? Yeah, I think one thing that limited me a lot when I was young, and I see it a lot, especially in young men, is to not overvalue yourself, especially financially so i think a lot of young men specifically struggle with they get done with school and they want to go make 80 or a hundred thousand dollars but they haven't created like they haven't created value they haven't proved that yet and just being humble and going out and, and taking the job and taking opportunities and working as hard as possible without that like unrealistic expectation of how much you should be making because once you do that that you'll make that money very quickly but a lot of people just limit themselves over and, and I know I did this a bunch of times. I had all these amazing opportunities present themselves to me when I was young, and I was like, "Well, I want to make eighty thousand dollars. So unless you pay me that, I'm not going to do it." Um, and it was just dumb. And I and I see it over and over again. And if I would have just taken whatever they had offered me, I I would have been making that or more very quickly. And so um, I think just for young people, that's one thing is to not to like overestimate their value and just just take opportunities and, and work as hard as they can. Um, and then the money's going to come as a as almost automatic result. Yeah, I love that. That's so huge. And there's even people that maybe you've lost your your job and you were someone at that job and you were making good money, but the market's not there right now. And you might need to take another job in order to create, pay, you know, take care of your family, but also the ability to start investing, investing in yourself first and foremost, then into maybe real estate or other passive opportunities so you can start the process of financial freedom. So Chase, absolutely love that. Look, you've been gracious with your time. We thank you for being on the show. If people want to get in touch with you, um, how can they contact you? 
social media is probably best. You know, Facebook, it's just under my name. And then on uh, Instagram, it's, I think it's Chase Calhoun dot real estate. Um, that's a, that's a good way to get a hold of me and reach out if, if I can be of any help. Beautiful. Well, we'll get those in the show notes. But again, Chase, thank you for taking time. It was early where he is for this interview out in California. So I appreciate you getting up with, uh, you know, getting out of bed from your family and doing the interview. But a lot of pearls, a lot of great wisdom. So thank you for being on the show. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. You got it. All right, guys. Well, look, I'd love for you guys to comment below. What did you take away? One nugget that was valuable from Chase. Make sure that you also give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit that notification button right next to it so that you can be notified when some of these great interviews come out. Because look, you are one nugget away from your life radically transforming. Shifting that mindset can change your entire life. And it's through interviews like this where you can pick up that nugget. So make sure you subscribe and hit that notification button. Other than that, thanks for joining guys. Have a great one. See you guys.